Um, hi, everybody. Um, I'm Martina. So Wasim presented um, some of the more thematic research that the Xerox Salon is involved in. I will be taking care more explicitly of the meta side of this talk. So it's going to be relating to our structural modes of knowledge making, questions around how we govern ourselves, how our intelligence is distributed and so on. So the talk will be divided into three sections of which the first and the last will be quite brief. Um, I'm going to try to be more concise there because I think what I want to get to um, is the second part of the talk, which is going to be relating to critical organizational nodes um, that we are contending with in our daily operations. So Zero X Salon Collective Body, um, I want to give a little bit of context. We're speaking here today as part of a series of conversations that are happening at Trust initiated on the theme of collective bodies. And as a collective body ourselves, we're trying to unpack a little bit what it means to think and work together as an assemblage of different forms. And that's kind of where we're coming from today. Um, so in this first section, I will provide a little bit of background relating to who we are and what we do. So what is the Xerox Salon? Um, before delving into an account of our internal structure, we thought it'd be useful to offer up a little bit of a prehistory and a summary of what we've been up to in the last few years. So the Xerox Salon was initiated at the beginning of the pandemic, and it was during a moment when occasions for critical th critically thinking together were very sparse. And it felt as though legacy institutions were struggling to meet the increasing demand for sense making. At its core, the Zero X Salon is a collective endeavor which critically interrogates digital culture, which is kind of the bulk uh, thematically of what we're interested in. The Zero X Salon is also an ongoing nonprofit experiment in symmetrical and asymmetrical knowledge sharing and participatory cultural production. And here, the two terms that are really important, I guess, are non-profit, meaning that um, we're not running this for money, and asymmetrical, meaning that as much as we try to be really distributed and symmetrical in the work that we produce, that's not always possible, and there are reasons and tensions as to why that is. The Zero X Salon is also incubated at trust, leveraging sprawling and localized intellectual networks. And with that, what we want to convey is that whilst we have um, a situated and physical presence, so we are embedded into a space that exists for people in real life, um, and on top of that, we're also embedded into a larger extended network that we're part of um, within Berlin, but also internationally. And I guess um, the single most important thing to note about the Xerox Salon is our composition. So we're made of uh, multiple layers, um, starting from Wasim and myself, who steward the um, Xerox Salon but we're also sustained by a vast network of community members and we're supported by, although never quite sufficiently so, by public funding and private patrons. So very briefly about our outputs. I'm gonna just run through a few of those. Um, it's clearly a selection. There's so much more that we've been up to, but maybe this is not the site to do a really in-depth exposition of what those projects have been. So for the purpose of today, I want to briefly speak about our series of discourse events. These are kind of the um, formal cornerstone of um, what we do, and we run them both offline here at Trust Physical Space, and occasionally online with our extended community whenever it's um, needed or wanted. And here we rehearse different strands of theory and culture pertaining to specific um, thematics that we're interested in researching further. So this is just um, an overview of some of the topics that we've been uh, discussing together. 
and with these uh, private uh, discourse events, we're trying to eschew the formalism of academic and professional expertise, which is largely achieved by kind of displacing the rigidity of the lecture format in favor of a more <laughs> informal, horizontal, um, permissive, and at times transgressive conversational style. And these periodic encounters are populated by with people from our extended networks, belonging to different milieus, um, coming from a variety of backgrounds. And we're also always trying to make sure that those who attend and are invited to our events um, belong to different groups. And we try especially promoting intergenerationalism by kind of coupling uh, the participation of younger voices with that of more established uh, thinkers or professionals. We're also running a residency program, which is currently in its uh, second cycle. We are currently incubating five different projects, incorporating activities ranging from formal academic inquiry, reading groups, listening sessions, RPG game design, performances. There's really a lot, um, and it's kind of mirroring um, our commitment to do post-disciplinary and media agnostic work. We've also, for a few years, uh, developed, um, designed, and play-tested an RPG card deck um, inspired by post-structuralist philosophy and zero exile on lore. The game acts as a ludic and pedagogic mechanism to initiate and steer post-disciplinary conversations from a variety of perspectives, trying to go beyond um, players' personal opinions and beliefs. Um, and we usually refer to the game as a kind of governance therapy tools where we're able to rehearse agreement and conflict, uh, consensus and dissensus in a way that feels anticipatory rather than urgent. And uh, this is the last iteration of the card deck, which is also included in an exhibition that's going to open on uh, the 1st of November um, at Le Commune in Geneva and it's called the Seashore of Endless Worlds. So if anybody's in Geneva there, please go check it out. And the last thing that um, I'm gonna touch on in terms of outputs is um, a theater play that was developed last year. Um, and it was part of a grant awarded to the Zero X Salon by the European Commission Starts Preparing the Present, um, through which the Salon um, kind of employed a few collaborators and created a um, kind of writing and working group uh, through which um, they kind of designed, wrote and staged this play which premiered um, at Helsinghor in Denmark last year. So now on to the critical organizational notes which are going to constitute the bulk of this presentation. Um, so these are nodes that have emerged from doing this type of work, um, and they are around practical and conceptual knots that we're trying to undo together. Um, and we're very thankful to Trust for inviting us tonight uh, to speak about this, because it also gave us like a little bit of a moment to reflect on what these issues are, because we're usually so taken with running um, the program that we're hosting, that it's very difficult for us to have a moment to really think thoroughly about our structure. And um, I guess it will become quickly apparent that all these nodes are interrelated and they're all broadly speaking to the question of what it means not only to be a collective body, but a collective body that ought to recursively self-regulate. And I raise these points, I guess, not only because there are things that we're dealing with and asking ourselves in the work that we do at the Zero X Salon, but I presume and I would hope that they will ring true to those of us who are community leaders, community organizers, who are part of collective body, mm. and um, yeah, in thinking together on how to resolve these issues. So. The first juncture um, that I want to speak about is the tension in our work between legibility and opacity. So Wasim and I often debate over whether the nature of the project is intrinsically opaque, 
And what we're trying to think through together is whether a struggle for legibility is by accident or by design. And part of this difficulty stems from a very early decision on the part of the Zero X Salon to kind of refute definition or not really formally parking itself um, with any camp. Um, so with this note, what we think about is what are the affordances of opacity um, and conversely to that, what are instead the risks that are inherent to it and what is it preventing us to do or to achieve within our community. So in short, who is this project available for and accessible to? And I guess we realize that we want to make sure that we're speaking from somewhere and that's not only like an intellectual concern, but over time it's become um, a practical hindrance, meaning that we need to, we try to mitigate our right to opacity with the need to encounter the world logistically, practically, financially, to basically be met by our public as well as our stakeholders. And there's two ways, um, that we've identified uh, an issue with legibility within the work, and one is intrinsic legibility, meaning that we, especially when we're accessing public funding or grant giving bodies and institutions, they struggle to read who we are and what we do at our core. And it's never quite clear um, whether we're talking to somebody on the grounds of um, being an art project or being, we're also very much in the crypto and Web3 space. Um, and we also do discourse and more para-academic work. So it's very difficult at times for um, stakeholders to read through our work. And then there is also um, an issue of extrinsic legibility where it becomes more of um, finding a valuable entry point uh, for our public to engage with our outputs. And that can also be quite challenging at times and it's happened more than once that there will be community members or maybe aspiring community members that are trying to engage with our work and don't quite know how to do so. So the question connected to this note is how do we render ourselves legible and what are the minimum viable scaffoldings that allow us to reach out into the sensible world? The second note that we'd like to open up for exploration is that of distribution. And in this case, I specifically want to talk about distribution um, relating to the conceptual spread in the work that we do. So how our knowledge is created, uh, affirmed, passed through our collective body by means of different activities. So it will have become clear by this point that the Zero X Salon is constituted by a sort of chimeric and modular assemblage of different people, different outputs, different exercises in thinking. So I thought that the best case study to think through distribution is that of our private discourse event series. For all our private discourse event series, we employ what is referred to as the Chatham House Rule, which is a convention often held to promote openness in discussing public policy and current affairs. And what the rule consists of is that, and I'm here quoting the um, definition, when a meeting or part thereof is held under the Chatham House rule, participants are free to use the information received, but neither the identity nor the affiliation of the speakers nor that of any other participant may be revealed. So one of the byproducts of employee Chatham House rule is that the epistemic ground that emerges from our various conversation is completely evenly distributed. That means that an insight, a thought, a piece of critique will always appear as collectively owned by Xerox Salon and never by one of its single participants. This has always kind of been the aspect of the Salon that was the most interesting to me because it kind of almost involuntarily latches on to and tries operationalizing um, some emerging theories of mind that claim that 
cognition and knowledge do not reside in the brain, but they are extended all the way across the bodies and artifacts that constitute an inhabited environment. And I thought it was really interesting here to leverage some of the work of Andy Clark and David Chalmers. And yeah, do they say here cognitive process isn't all in the head, which I think is really sp speaks very closely to the work that we do. So in the best case scenario, epistemic distribution means that both credit and attribution are spread evenly across the collective body that is constituted by our community, which is obviously a great side effect of the work that we do. And this allows for freedom of exchange, intertextuality, and a concrete possibility for people to hold different positions at different times without repercussion. So what we try to do within our work and in our conversations is to turn the group into the pedagogical unit um, and therefore try to undo the binary dynamic of master and student that is more habitual with legacy institutions. So in the worst case scenario though, epistemic distribution can look a little bit more like this, meaning that when a position gets further watered down and single agency is dissolved, um, we run the risk of sitting in circles, kind of bouncing the same opinion off of each other. And this is particularly true on the grounds that the people in the room are always people we have affiliations to, whether those be personal or professional. So it's highly likely that those will be people we're intellectually aligned with. And so we want to really avoid the uh, pitfalls of homogeneity and eschew the risk of a sort of echo chambery effect within the conversations that we run. And ultimately, we don't want to be in a place where epistemic credit turns into a position where we're lacking epistemic accountability, where the stakes of the eye completely disappear. So the question here will be, how do we prevent a collective body from becoming an ossified unit of sameness? The third note um, is constituted by the question of governance in our work. So it's a different way of talking about distribution from the side of organization. And here we mutually acknowledge that while we are a collective body, we're also very much a centralized entity and practically speaking made up of me and the person that spoke before me. Um, so only from that point do we extend to, you know, other fellows and residents and collaborators and then our community. So when we are in conversation about this, we usually try to avoid the kind of horizontal vertical binary, especially to the extent that these days it seems um, horizontality to be very, very easily equated to good, um, verticality very e easily equated to bad, which we think is a little bit facile and not really true to the experience of what it is to organize. Um, so we need to, we recognize that we need to govern our body. Um, that's just not gonna happen autonomously. Um, and so we need to employ reasonable and effective strategies to streamline and orient our efforts, which means we need to mitigate the natural tendency towards chaos, entropy, disorder, with decision-making rules, protocols, and the like. So the way that we work uh, is that we are organized into concentric circles, um, the two of us being the core, and then the first layer um, outside of us being the, um, a, a core team of collaborators who work with us very regularly on projects. And then from there, our larger community, meaning people who attend our events or engage with our work. And then the further extension of that will be the larger public that we're trying to communicate to, but at a further remove. And it's interesting for us because we notice how much um, the impact is back and forth. Um, and so the outer layers can really influence um, and create a ripple effect into the work that we do. And the other way around is obviously also true. So I 
particularly wary um, that we are trying, we're not trying to resist structural order. Um, we're not trying to fall into the tyranny of structuralness. And so whilst they're a very defeating and parochial approach, um, I like instead to think, I like to think with Catherine Malibu and her idea of anarchism, uh, which she's leveraging from um, Pierre-Joseph Proudhon. And I thought it was really interesting to recontextualize anarchist work um, in this way where she's saying basically that instead of disorder, anarchy means another order, an order without power. And I think that's a really convincing and intense encapsulation of what it is to be work, to do, to do work that's orderly without power. So the question here is how do we achieve order without power? And then finally, the last note that we want to think about is the question of scale. At what scale is it possible for us to operate? Um, it is true that IRL community is not something that you can scale up. Uh, but there is like an upper bound to what's possible to be doing there. And strictly speaking, because it rests on human relations and intimacies, which are only possible on the level of the personal encounter. But still, um, we're trying to give ourselves some stakes and to think through this question from also like a political lens. And so to think, um, and I like to leverage the work of uh, Italian mathematician Matilde Marcoli. She goes by Aurora Polito in this particular paper for some reason. Um, and she's asking the question of how does anarchism handle large scale structures? Is there a good scaling strategy that interpolates from the small to the large? Is anarchism such a system destined to only work in the scale of small local communities? And so we're trying to address this question by the, the, the way that we think about it is we're trying to turn the zero X salon into a protocol, so to develop methodologies that are both modular and reproducible, so that we can encourage the emergence of similar epistemic networks elsewhere. So moving the idea of scale from something that is synonym to with bigger to something that is replicated elsewhere in attendance to the condition of intellectual habitability of a specific site. Um, so on this, the questions are, what level of scale should we be satisfied with and what scope should our gaze be pointing at and why? So just to conclude, um, what is to come? I'll just mention a couple of things. Well, the first is maybe like the most urgent is financial sustainability, which I know is something that both um, that we speak about very often here at Trust. Um, so the way that we conduct our work is mostly through public funding. So we want to be transparent about the fact that we're undergoing very habitually the process of um, applying and rarely receiving funding from uh, public institutions. And then we're developing what we're calling affiliate pathways. And this refers to the question of scale and um, the idea of making the salon into a protocol. So we're identifying uh, community organizers and community leaders and people who are really invested um, in the theoretical space that we're part of um, and ask them to either come do an event with us um, leveraging their networks or potentially reproduce um, some of the stuff that we do wherever they are within their um, social milieus. And then we'll have a few more both public and private residency events. And then finally, there is a few other projects in the pipeline and one of which is um, a further iteration of uh, our RPG card deck for the purpose of uh, Web3 governance. Um, yeah, so this is us. Thank you for listening. It was a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Trust.